seven, four, five, six. I think we need one more for quorum. Right? Yeah. Okay. Worst case scenario, everybody, if we don't have enough for quorum, we can still have discussion. We just can't vote on things. Hi, Justine. I see you joined us in the attendees. Um, when we get to the discussion portion, we will promote you to panelists so you can um, share your screen and turn on your camera and all of that. But right now we're just waiting for one more COA member to come so we can officially start the meeting. There's Margie. We will promote to panelist. Margie, if you can hear me. Okay, yeah, good. And we have Jasmine, great. I'm gonna go ahead and call us to order. Julie, if you could do the roll call, please. Okay. Uh, Juliet Ballard. Here. Dexter, Michigan. Uh, Marta Larson. Uh, Marie Grass. Present, calling from Milan, Michigan. Margaret Reynolds. Present, calling in from Pittsfield Township. Elizabeth Thompson, excused. Jennifer Green. Uh, Phyllis uh, Her Herzig. Present, calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Bruce Astron. Present, calling from Ann Arbor. Jennifer Heckendorn. Dorn. From Detroit this morning. Brenda McKinney, excused. Jasmine Cooper. I thought I saw her. Jasmine, Jasmine, we couldn't hear you. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Yes. Okay, I think what happens, it connects to my phone automatically. And so, phone's not in the room. But uh, present, calling from Ann Arbor. Um, Allison Foreman. Present, calling from Ypsilanti, Michigan. And Annie Somerville. Okay. And please, um, Marta just joined us. Mar uh, Marta Larson. Present, uh, participating from Northfield Township, Michigan. Great. Everybody. Um, all right, then next up is public participation. In the attendees, I see uh, Gary and Justine. They're both going to be presenting in a little bit, but if either one of you wants to make public comment at this time, you're more than welcome to. You just raise your hand and I will allow you to talk. Gary. Hi, good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to address the COA this morning. Um, I would just like to take this moment to say hello to all of the friends that I have on the COA, and I'm looking forward to uh, meeting uh, new members that I, I'm not uh, familiar with. So thanks for the opportunity, and um, I find it hard to believe that we're talking about a campaign for a millage this morning, but that's a good thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Any response from um, the CUA to public participation? 
welcome Gary. <laughs> Thank you, Margie. Yeah, well, it is it is amazing. We're here to talk about the millage. <laughs> it really well, is. It's a, it's <laughs> unreal. It's been a long run, huh? Very. Yeah. <clears throat> Great, then uh, let's move on to the approval of the August two minutes. Do I have a motion? So move. Margie. And then Phyllis, I saw your hand. Are you seconding? I'll second. Great. Any discussion? Then Julie, if you could do our vote. Okay. Go down the list again. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to make sure I got that right. Yeah. Uh, Janet Ballard. Ju yes. uh, Julia Ballard, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Marta, Marta Larson. Yes. Marie Grass. Yes. Margaret Reynolds. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson is excused or absent. Jennifer Green is absent. Phyllis Herzog. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Bruce Astron. Yes. Jennifer, Jennifer Heckendor Dorn. Yes. Brenda is excused and absent. Jennifer, uh, Jasmine Q Cooper. Yes. Uh, Allison Foreman. Yes. And Annie Summer, uh, Somerville, unexcused and absent. Great. Thank you. Motion passes. All right. So next up is our discussion items. And um, I'm going to be adding in an additional discussion item. And actually, we're going to kick off with them first. I'm going to be Justine promoting you to panelist. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to promote you to panelist right now, too, since I'm over here. Um, so originally, what we had hoped to do at this meeting was have a weatherization group come and an emergency preparedness group come. Um, they are not able to come until our October meeting. So we thought it would be good to um, talk about a few things that are coming up in the pipeline. One of them is the millage that the COA recommended to the Board of Commissioners. Um, but before we get to that piece, um, both Phyllis and I had the pleasure of talking with um, Justine here. She is working with a group on Teresa's Law. It has to do with um, assisted living and some other things. And she's going to do a much better job talking to you all about this and why it's a little bit more urgent that we talk about it now um, and entertain that. So Justine, I will actually just pass it off to you. You can introduce yourself and then um, start sharing about Teresa's Law. Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I hope all of you got the uh, flyer. If not, I will uh, try and uh, fill you in as much as I can. Unfortunately, Patricia Scravis uh, can't join us. She was she is really the uh, force behind this uh, legislation. Um, she has food poisoning, so I am her stand-in, and we can always follow up with um, more information. Um, I thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak with you, uh, and uh, many thanks to uh, Phyllis Herzak for all of her support and input. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm retired from Michigan Medicine. I have a long career in uh, gerontology. I started out um, uh, working uh, on the mental wards of Ypsilanti State Hospital, so you know I go way back. Uh, but I've had quite a bit of experience in working in different care settings with older adults starting on the uh, mental wards at IBC and nursing homes, um, assisted living communities. And the thread through all of that uh, in terms of what makes the difference in, with regards to quality of care for the residents is the support and dignity that you give to the staff. And um, so... These two aims uh, to uh, improve the quality of life for the resident as well as to provide uh, support for the staff with uh, training uh, is a part of Teresa's law. Um, the other uh, part of my career was um, providing counseling to families and older adults 
planning long-term care. So that's how I got into this. Um, let me tell you about the uh, problem here that uh, Teresa's Law is addressing. Um, the administration of medication by unlicensed staff, um, the staff has minimal training. They have 25 minutes of training. Uh, and most of the training after that is done on the job by those who have no required medical background. Most residents are not capable of self-administering their own medications, and this is confirmed by the industry as well as by the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. And no one passing um, medications or the supervision of medications is required to have medical credentials, as well as the investigators who go out and look into complaints. So the system is absent uh, any kind of uh, medical input. Now, um, why is this problem uh, so urgent? Uh, medication errors are the primary errors and they've been increasing over the uh, last uh, four years. Um, medication errors cause harm to the residents. Uh, there's undue stress and turnover of direct care workers. And this is all substantiated. I mean, this isn't uh, unique to uh, Michigan in terms of the problem of turnover because of uh, stress on the, on the job and lack of training. But this is particular to Michigan. And I, and I think it's striking. 73% of other states do not allow the passing of medications by unlicensed staff. And in Michigan, unlicensed staff um, pass meds that are prescription and non-prescription with um, you know, non-medical supervision. So um, this is the reason, part of the reason why you have the kind of errors that you, that you do. And let me talk uh, about some of those medication errors that are found in investigation reports. Wrong medications are given, wrong, it's given to the wrong person at the wrong time, the wrong dose in the wrong way. Um, there, um, they are to keep what's called an administration, um, medication administration record. And, you know, these are often incomplete. So, when the next person is going to be on the shift, you know, they're going off a record that isn't complete. Um, there's a failure to recognize medication side effects and a delayed response in seeking medical help. Um, and I'll give you some examples of these and missed doses for days and weeks and months. That sounds hard to believe, but it does happen. Let me give you some uh, examples of the um, medication errors. Um, residents did not receive medications for at least seven days. These are established um, violations. Suffered significant fall as a result, died one week later. <clears throat> Resident was given warfarin for 14 days, um, was not given. And um, so this person was hospitalized with arterial fibrillation. Another one, staff took into their own hands to crush time release capsules and put into liquids. This is not allowed. Uh, licensed designee took into their own hands to change resident Seroquel, uh, 100 milligrams nightly dosage to two separate doses to manage behavioral problems. Resident observed as drowsy, lethargic, did not, um, uh, this course wasn't uh, approved and um, there were numerous other violations. In Patricia's own um, experience and how this uh, all got um, triggered was that her mom um, uh, was a diabetic and um, she, was, she had to have fast acting insulin so this means that you have to give it right before meals. Well, again and again and again, the staff was giving it early. And uh, Patricia happened to be there one day when, uh, when her mom was given an early dose and her mom was having um, a um, 
a consequence uh, because, of, because of that. Uh, and the staff member didn't recognize the side effects and she didn't know what to do. Uh, fortunately, uh, Patricia had some candy with her. She was able to give her mother some um, candy so that uh, she uh, didn't continue to uh, go into a, um, a hypoglycemic um, episode. Um, and, um, you know, that was just an example of somebody not being aware of side effects and not even knowing what to do. Um, now, one of the things that we're trying to do is, of course, minimize these problems through the legislation. The, the original bill um, has been modified um, and it is slimmed down. And, and now we're focusing on transparency uh, so that it increases uh, family members' decision-making and we're uh, focusing on improving direct care workers training. Um, and this is only for their current job. It will not add any responsibilities to them. It's just to make them more competent in what they're already doing. Um, and families need to have more um, transparency regarding the training of the staff as well as who owns um, these facilities. You know that big business is now into um, any, any uh, kind of uh, healthcare. Um, and um, so families can just make their, um, their own decisions about that. Um, and the other thing is that um, uh, the staff uh, in terms of their training, and let me give you a little idea of the training that we're asking for, is that they have comprehensive training taught by licensed uh, medical professional uh, versus a 25-minute uh, video. Competency uh, testing uh, post the initial uh, course and then yearly. Diabetic-specific training by a registered nurse or a licensed medical professional. Um, PRNs, you know, um, as needed medications require um, uh, quite a bit of judgment. And um, uh, so uh, what are the desired and undesired effects in terms of when you give a, a PRN? And following doctor's orders is another uh, big problem that is experienced in these communities. What we'd like to see too is ethics training so that there's a culture of, of compliance and integrity. That, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, let's support people who make mistakes and, 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 and um, uh, give them the training that they need. Empathy, um, communication skills, and we know that older adults have hearing loss, dementia, cognitive issues, all kinds of sensory issues and disabilities that uh, require some special communication skills. There are some very difficult residents to deal with. I mean, um, they can be combative. It can be very hard on the staff. So the staff need support on, on how to uh, help people, how to lower the temperature in these situations. And this comes with um, knowing how to do these things. Um, I'm gonna stop here and give you a, an opportunity to uh, ask questions. Um, there are some other points I wanna make, but I don't wanna leave without giving you the opportunity to ask some questions. Anyone have a question? Margie? You're muted, Margie. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm a nurse and mm -hmm. I've seen these and I've also, had a lot of experience with long-term care facilities um, as a, a board member, committee member, et cetera. But I think your your point on lessons on ethics, empathy, and communication skills, I don't know whether you have dot points under that, what it, what it really means. You mentioned um, uh, the <clears throat> having people feel okay about reporting errors. And one of the things I think happens is that people don't report errors because they're because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And yet um, that's so important to do. And people need to be 
um, uh, open and not punished. Mm -hmm. um, and in, you know, if I look at nursing home ratings where they report how many med errors they have mm -hmm. in, in the past period, so many times it says none. And if you think for a hot minute that a nursing home has no medication <laughs> errors, think again. Yeah, so right. they're, um, they're so easy to do. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to make a mistake. And right. people need, I, I think that you need to press that hard. Okay. Um, and it, it doesn't really, um, you mentioned it, but it doesn't really say that in the, um, in the, Oh, in the flyer. Uh, well, one of the things, uh, you know, we're not blaming the staff. Um, right, right. And, 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 and in Patricia's own experience, she did not blame the staff person. It was a lack of, uh, of training. Yeah. And, you know, this has to do uh, with the industry and with Lara, uh, who sets the regulations. Uh, that's part of the problem, the regulations um, and the consequences for violations are not meaningful. Um, there are uh, some of these communities have repeated and repeated and repeated violations. Um, so that um, I think that it, the, the staff, um, they, they need to, you know, it takes time to have a culture. Uh, you yeah. have to prove to people you're not gonna blame and punish them. And yeah. that takes time. You have to build up trust. Yes. Um, so I, 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 you know, I worked at Mich uh, Michigan Medicine, and that was um, something that uh, uh, was said again and again and again. And it, when we had hotlines, <laughs> uh, and you know, it, it has to come from leadership, and you have to prove to people that you want to help them do the job the best way they can. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce? Um, thank you for the presentation and for um, sharing this stuff with us. Uh, two things. One is, um, I just wanted to, on a personal note, I spent almost 10 years um, overseeing the care of my mother in a variety of care settings. And mm -hmm. I can attest to both the heroic efforts of staff, in particular, mm -hmm. underpaid and under supported as they may have been. Mm -hmm. um, and these are pretty nice facilities, national chains in some cases, mm -hmm. local and other. Um, but um, the thing that I'm most concerned about, I appreciate the training. I appreciate the fact that, you know, everybody's not very clear. I'm not trying to blame the staff. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in that there's sort of a corporate culture that's um, taking over even more than in the past, um, many of these facilities. And the question that comes to mind, the word that comes to mind and the piece of the legislation that I don't see is accountability. And accountability is not easy in these cases mm -hmm. because a mm -hmm. lot of these corporations have set up structures to um, avoid accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge problem um, on the national scene as well mm -hmm. as in Michigan. The trending in these facilities is towards private equity Private equity has very, very strong lobbyists and very strong mm -hmm. ways to get around any kind of accountability. And um, it leaves staff, it leaves um, families really with very little recourse. So even mm -hmm. with training and even with more supportive environments, um, excuse me, and even with um, transparency, I'm very, very concerned that there's no real Mm -hmm. leverage or accountability mm -hmm. here. And I don't know whether that was discussed or whether that was taken out of what is now the slimmed, slimmed down version. Um, that was part of the original bill. And the substitute bill uh, right now focuses on the transparency and um, uh, staff training. Um, there will be uh, another bill that focuses on uh, accountability. Uh, one of the problems that I mentioned is that there aren't meaningful consequences. And that's your point, Bruce. Uh, and we have to make the consequences meaningful if we're going to change behaviors. Uh, many other states uh, have ways of uh, having consequences um, that um, change behavior. 
and that's what we want to do. We want to we want to change uh, behavior so that um, they're not getting uh, the same violations for the same bad behavior. Yeah. So um, that is our next step. But right now, uh, the sponsor of the bill just wants to put forward these two measures and then deal with accountability. Just a quick response that that would be terrific. I just hope people hold that sponsor's feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. We have some very committed uh, House representatives who uh, the committee on seeing this through. Thank you. You know, we came here today to ask for your endorsement um, of this legislation and also help in advocacy. And we can really need advocacy, help in advocacy uh, all over um, the uh, state of Michigan as um, well as Washtenaw County. I, uh, I live in Washtenaw County, so I try to advocate as much as I can here. Um, but, you know, we have uh, an interest in uh, reaching out all over the state of Michigan. So any networks that you have, uh, any suggestions you can uh, provide are more than welcome. Uh, we have um, a number of advocates working with us on Teresa's Law, and, um, you know, they're willing to help us outreach. Margie? Have have you made presentations to the state medical society and the um, nurse Michigan Nurses Association? Um, we ha we haven't made um, presentations to them, um, Margie. I I did reach out to the retired nurses. Um, I don't know if you know Robbie Duda. No. Uh, okay. Well, she heads up the retired nurses, and right now. Um, they're working on um, a, a legislation um, that is uh, something that um, they have a priority. They they certainly support uh, what we are uh, what we are doing, but they're not going to take an active role in it. Uh, sometimes people say, "Well, you know, there's a staff shortage, <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, we don't want to pressure the industry." Well. You know, I'll tell you what, um, if your local fire department had a staff shortage, wouldn't you want them to train the firemen that are there? I mean, that's really not an excuse. We're just saying, have the people who are working now be more competent. We're not, we're not trying to solve the problem of direct care workers, which are, that's a chronic nationwide problem. We're just trying to enhance the training that is going on with the people who are currently in the workforce and to help the residents who are there now and build a better future here in the state of Michigan. And we can do this, um, but we need advocacy and we need endorsements. Mm -hmm. Phyllis? I would be surprised if... Uh the state medical society would not support this. They, can, you, they can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know their structure. Okay. But I'll, 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 I'll reach out to them. Yeah, I, th I think you should. Okay. Um, yeah. Can, <clears throat> sorry. Can we, um, can I pose a motion to support this? Um, Teresa's law um, as from our uh, our vantage point as a commission on aging. Um, and another thing to consider adding to that motion is recommending that the board of commissioners support the um, support the passing of Teresa's law. Can we include yeah. some I, I agree with that. And can we include some reference to the, the we also support the need for the added legislation that was mentioned? Mm -hmm. I, want, okay. I think we should go on record as, as standing behind the accountability mm -hmm. since they separated out the legislation.
I'm drafting something based on this discussion and I'll, I'll read it back. Any, um, anyone else want to, to second what's been discussed? Well, we probably need to wait till I draft this motion actually. Well, I would second it if I knew what you had there, Marie. <laughs> yep. Hold on just a second. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a motion for the Commission on Aging to endorse Teresa's law and recommend the County Board of Commissioners to support Teresa's law and well can you say your thing again Bruce please can I unmute myself um is there actual additional legislation or they're creating they're they're going to create the other legislation I guess to clarify yes um that would be um, the next step is to um, discuss uh, the accountability piece. Um, there has to be more discussion about that. And then, you know, the a bill would have to be formed to move forward on that. Uh, again, we have a lot of stats on what other states are doing uh, so that um, there's groundwork on that. Um, and so we would be ready to... Um, uh, provide that kind of information so that a, a bill, you know, could begin to be discussed and then moved on. So maybe it's something to the effect of and the intent to create future accountability or um, an accompanying accountability legislation. You know, if I can say here, Teresa's law is HB um, 4841. Um, so if you're going to um, support it, you put in the House bill. I understand that the House bill number could potentially change, but uh, right now that's the, the bill number. 4841? 4841, that's right. Mm -hmm. So this is what I have so far, everyone. Um, well, Phyllis, because you're making, you're starting the motion. Motion for the Commission on Aging to endorse Teresa's Law, HB 4841, and recommend the County Board of Commissioners to support Teresa's Law. Marta? I have a couple suggestions. First of all, I think we should put in what Teresa's law is about, um, at least in very compact form. And I'm wondering if that and the accountability piece aren't shouldn't actually be two motions. Oh, that's good. That's good. I thought this was about prescription meds. Well, it's about both are delivered, both prescription and non-prescription in, in terms of uh, the training. But it's, that's not abuse and neglect, that's prescription and non-prescription medication errors. Well, neglect does come into it because, um, uh, you know, people aren't given the proper medication and there are hospitalizations and deaths and um, ER unnecessary ER visits. All of these things are preventable. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying I think the law is about 
prescription and non-prescription medication as its primary focus, or am I not informed properly? Well, I, it's I, about tr training the workers, uh, the direct care workers. The training is what the legislation is about, and transparency. So focusing on training and transparency about uh, medical care or or um, it's really the it because ab abuse and neglect I agree with Marta it sort of takes you to um, adult protective services realm mm -hmm. and and that's not what this is about no um, no it's not and it, it's not medical these aren't medical settings uh, so that wouldn't be something uh, a term that uh, would be would be fit would fit the settings. Um, they are providing the administration of medications. Medication rather mm -hmm. than medical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest uh, additional training and transparency for direct care workers. Mm -hmm. And um, I would also add medication between non-prescription and errors. Like this one one last possible word insertion where it says training and transparency i know it wasn't in the discussion but i would consider adding training support and transparency yeah that's good the transparency is for families um right. so that you know they can make better decisions so if I'm, i see if your I'm hand after Excuse me, comma after training. Training, support, and transparency. Juliet? Hi, can you describe, I'm sorry, what additional training specifically uh, the law requires? Okay, so let me, let me, um, let me go to that. Um, I know that there are already, um, training sessions that direct care workers are supposed to take through the county, um, a class, uh, an exam, and other things. Um, I'm just wondering um, what other courses that they would be required to take. Um, these are uh, mostly private businesses, mm -hmm. and um, their mission statement, uh, the, the way the law reads is that the training is appropriate to their mission statement. Mm -hmm. So it can um, change from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, there is, as I mentioned, um, this um, training that they can take from the state that is 25 minutes. And the additional training that we are asking for uh, in the legislation is um, a, a complete uh, course uh, that talks about um, the five rights of uh, medication management. So it's the right dose, the right person, the right way, the right time, um, and the, um, let's see here, I have to find that. Um, and the right, I mentioned the right time. So that they have a complete um, course that is taught by a registered nurse or a pharmacist or a doctor, a licensed medical professional, um, that they have training on uh, PRNs because these drugs have parameters. Uh, when do you get it? When do you, uh, what do you, what do you, what's the right time? Uh, what kind of symptoms uh, should be noticed in terms of providing that? What kind of side effects um, are there? Uh, diabetic training uh, so that they know about the, um, there are different kinds of insulin and, um, and how to give uh, insulin. Uh, so that would be um, a part of it also. Um, let's I'm, see here. Um, I'm just, for, from the commission standpoint, the things that are um, listed as a solution um, are things that are in place in our state requirements currently. So I would um, be concerned that the only thing that I see that's not currently a um, 
uh, specific thing are the cited violations in the past five years and overseeing that. But the other items listed are already a requirement within the state. Would would there be something added to this to say that there would be something in addition to this? Because some of these the state already does in excess. So I'm uh -huh. just considering the direct care workers, if we already have them sitting through 12 hour trainings for medications and then doing all these other things, is there something that we can word it so that it would be something more because this exists, but if we're gonna make a really strong impact, it would have to be in addition to this because this is our baseline now. Um, you know what I mean? I just want to make sure okay. if they go through with the legislation and stuff that it's very impactful. Right. Yeah. Instead um, of just just maybe um, saying, let's just continue as is, and then we'll have the same impact what, versus adding additional requirements. Well, right now, the requirements um, for training, as I mentioned, 25 minutes is a video with a Q and A that uh, is followed. And this is um, uh, allowed by LARA, um, the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. And then any additional training is on the job. And um, that depends on the mission of the particular adult foster care home. So it can vary from um, home to uh, home. Um, so, and the industry is on board with this. They see the need uh, for more comprehensive uh, training, um, that it would be a course that would cover um, the um, five rights of medication training. And then added to this would be uh, more substantial information on delivering PRNs and um, uh, also, uh, more training on diabetic care. Um, so, the, so the industry is on board with this. They see the need for more comprehensive training. That would be when the person is initially comes on board. Uh, then there would be a competency test. And then annually, there would be competency testing. So all of this um, would be a new new way of going forward in, in providing training for direct care workers in adult foster mm -hmm. care. Now there is another kind of uh, assisted living that isn't covered in this legislation, um, but this is only for adult foster care. Um, so for Washtenaw County, if you go on the Washtenaw County site, there is a direct um, an outline of what's required in order to pass meds in Washtenaw County. And there's a course, there's a test, there's um, all kinds of other things that they have to do that are all facilitated by a nurse. Um, and they have to take a course and then they have to wait a week and go back and take a test. Uh, they have to pass meds 10 times. There's all kinds of requirements under supervision. I just want to make sure that in Washtenaw County, specifically what we're representing, that we're not watering down our requirements. If I may. That we want, you know what I mean? Because we already yeah. have established state requirements. People might not follow them, but I don't, I would feel uncomfortable with them watering down what we're already worked so hard to get to. I would, I would like to see something that is even stronger than it is now to approve so that we would be reaching towards something rather than regressing what our requirements on. And it's on the Washtenaw County site of what the requirements are to be able to pass meds in an unlicensed. I have set. a clarifying question. So the stuff that you're referencing from the Washtenaw County site, is that Washtenaw County rules mm -hmm. or is that state rules? That's Washtenaw County that gets the directives from the state. The um, the the adult foster care communities in uh, Washtenaw County follow the uh, regulations of LARA, the Department of Licensing and, and Regulatory Affairs. That's the state authority. Um, that's who um, the standards that they have to live up to. Um, you know what you're talking about may cover other. Um, 
care communities, but the adult foster care follow the state laws, regulations. Um, I see Marta, then Phyllis, then Annie. Um, yeah, my thought, I have two thoughts. First of all, I think whatever motion we pass should indicate that it's a Michigan um, proposal, not a U.S. proposal. Oh, yes. The other thing is, um, is this law specifically aimed only at adult foster care? And if so, it sh the motion should say that. Um, but yes. I think uh, Juliet's points are well taken, and maybe we should do some more research before we pass a motion like this to make sure we're not getting ourselves into that sort of situation that she suggested. Well, it's only adult foster care, uh, one type of licensed um, assisted living in the state of, uh, of Michigan. And um, as I say, um, this is what would be required for them to follow to meet state standards, to meet Michigan state standards. Um, so the law specifically, the proposed law specifically addresses adult foster care? That's right. The regulations specifically address adult foster care. That, That's right. Specific they're, 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 not, they're not relevant to nursing homes. They're not relevant to homes for the aged. They're not relevant to hospitals. They're not relevant to any other setting, just adult foster care. Uh, Phyllis, then Annie. Um, I was just wondering, Juliet, uh, what you uh, shared with us is really very significant. But it, you mentioned that uh, would the medications would be administered through a nurse. And nurses, I guess, are usually not available at adult foster care homes. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so these AFC homes are not in compliance with, with whatever law is. Uh, you well, Phyllis, you make a good point because they're not medical facilities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they don't have to follow uh, medical guidelines. There's no director of nursing. There's no medical director. Um, they have a social model. And... Um, they are to be home-like. Uh, but what has happened over the years in assisted living in general is that the acuity levels of residents have increased. Uh, the average age of people going in uh, to uh, assisted living, all kinds of assisted living in the state of Michigan is 85 plus. So when you have people going in at that age, they have multiple chronic illnesses and um, their uh, need for care is higher. And the industry just hasn't caught up with it in Michigan. That's all. Um, you know, they, they, and as I said, you know, other states will not allow um, unlicensed staff to administer medications, even in um care settings that have a social model so that's the distinction annie yeah i just have a question who is responsible for um is there a cost associated with the continuing education um, and i guess if so who's responsible for covering that the uh cost is the state would not cover the uh, cost it would be um the uh, homes that would cover the cost. Would the homes pass that on to the employee? The cost? Um, yeah, I guess would no, they charge there them would, for the No, there is, is there... There, there is no, um, no, the, the cost uh, would not be passed on to the uh, employee, no. Um, no, the, um, that would not happen. Does it say that in the bill? Um, I can check that. I, I will be glad to check that. But I have not seen anything about the cost being uh, passed on to the uh, employee. But that is a question that I can uh, get answered, and um, we can we can get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, 
I see Bruce and Juliet, but really quick, just as a yeah, time, very quick. because we have, okay. no, just a second. Um, we have um, a couple of other things that we want to get to. Um, so I have the motion drafted and I have Annie's question that Justine's going to look into. Um, and then I think that it would be most prudent to, to table this and then have Justine and Patricia come back next time to have additional discussion. So with that in mind, Bruce, then Juliet. Yeah, I, I was going to support that very point. Um, and the only other question I had was, you've mentioned other states that seem to do it better. Has Have you modeled some of your language after those states? Yes. Okay. But I would agree that this is a little more complicated and maybe we should wait until we can sort of wrap our arms around it better. Okay, so what other outstanding questions are there? There's the question of, of um, is the cost going to be passed on to the employee? And what other question? Juliet, did you still have something? Um, I, a couple of questions I would have if mm -hmm. we're talking about adult foster care, um, who would be uh, funding the nurse uh, population that would be supervising these homes? There, um, okay. There is no nurse population that's supervising these homes. There would be, um, you know, that isn't a part of the legislation. Um, the legislation just calls for training by uh, a medical, a licensed medical uh, professional. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, yeah, so that would be uh, what, uh, the initial training um, would be done by a licensed medical professional. But, but my question was, and then I won't ask any more questions, is that would the state provide that training by that licensed yes. nurse? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I have a link that I can forward to the group of an example of what's required in Washtenaw County so that everyone can take a look at that and see if that would be something that this would be something that would maybe lower that requirement or heighten and give more um a little bit more ethics to the whole process. Julia, could you include me on, on that too? Yes, please? yes. I can include it to the group and I think they thank can you. pass it to you. All yes. right, thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming, Justine. Sounds like we're gonna see you again in October. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds I will uh, make sure that you get that information and you um, get the link beforehand. And All right. um, until the morning. Thank you up. very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. One and all. Yes. And if there are any more questions afterwards, you know, just forward them. Be glad to come back and look into things and make sure you're satisfied. Great. Thank you. But thank you very much. Bye. All right, so we are going to transition to Say Yes to Seniors, and Gary Muntz is going to be doing that presentation for us. Um, I just want to remind the group that um, several months ago, we as a commission did recommend a, or a senior millage, and the Board of Commissioners did agree to put that on the ballot unanimously. Um, Gary's going to be talking about some of the work that's happening with Say Yes to Seniors. Um, the Commission on Aging is not allowed as, you know, a government body to participate in campaigning. Um, but as individuals, as community members might listen to this group or this presentation, um, there may be opportunities for individuals to plug in. So with that in mind, Gary, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Marie. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting listening to Justine's comments this morning. I don't think there could be probably a better endorsement for why we need a senior millage in Washtenaw County. We have the, 80, the 85 plus group is the fastest growing group. We know that that needs service in our county. She reinforced that. So I just wanted to take a minute to touch on that. Uh, I'll try to make my comments brief, but informative for you this morning. Um, as we said, uh, some of you may not have been around from the beginning of the meeting, but Margie and I and Marie were remarking on, I have to sort of you know pinch myself to realize that we're here this morning discussing a campaign for a ballot initiative to have an older person's millage in Washtenaw County. It's almost seems surreal or unreal for me that we're, we're actually here. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, I, it, it is just quite surprising that we've come to this point. I want to say that obviously the COA has had a large part in where we are today. So I want you all to reach around and pat yourselves on the back. Make sure your arms are long enough to give yourself a good congratulatory. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I just want to say that this conversation this morning is by no means the, uh, the beginning and the end this will be an ongoing revisited kind of thing, an iterative process. Uh, some of us have participated in ballot campaigns before, some have not, but we're building one from the ground up here. So it's a learning experience in many ways for some of us. But the same things that have gotten us here will get us to a successful outcome. And that is collaboration, communication, and cooperation. Uh, we've been at this for a long time uh, the same commitment and passion that's brought us here will be the things that make us successful in the end. So I, I don't want us to lose sight of how important collaboration is. I'm going to talk about collaboration a little bit when it, when it gets down to how we conduct our campaign. Uh, I think one thing I'd like to do is just quickly, you know, okay, so, you know, July 10th, the Board of Commissioners, you know, threw down the gauntlet and passed the ballot initiative. So what's transpired? It's taken us a while to spin up our gears, but gears are spinning. Uh, one of the first things that we realized, we reached out to other campaigns that had been successful. Primarily, we reached out to Ingham County and Kalamazoo, both of whom have been successful. Recently, the Ingham County renewal passed by 80% in their, in their county. So I thought that what they had done and what others have done is a good model for us to look at and follow if we want to be successful. One of the things they brought up, which we really hadn't considered was, and uh, Marie touched on it this morning. Uh, you know, we've had a core group of agencies that have been pushing and pulling and struggling to get this on the ballot. <clears throat> but when it comes to advocating for a yes vote, those agencies are in a difficult position. And we can talk more about that. Marie's talked about that. So basically, what the other groups have done, Ingham, both Ingham and, and Kalamazoo, is they formed a separate group, a campaign group comprised of citizens who were able to advocate for a yes vote without any restrictions because of their connections to other nonprofit agencies in the county. So that's basically what we've done here is we've begun to spun up a campaign committee or spin up a campaign committee of people who are not affiliated or associated with any agency in the county. Uh, the talks with those other groups have been really uh, informative about uh, what was the funding for their campaign? Where did the funding come from? How did they raise their money? What did they do with their money? Uh, was there organized opposition? How did they face it? Long story short, uh, a, a, a treasure trove of, of things to look for in a campaign so we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. So. What have we done? What have we actually done? We've talked with these people, which have been very informative, but we really have been on the phone. We've been on email and we've been making a lot of contacts. We've reached out to many, many, many people and organizations already. I will lead off by saying that we've reached out to the Michigan AARP and we will most likely, I mean, uh, be endorsed by Michigan AARP. They're working through their internal process that, that they do. There's a set of uh, rules and regulations they follow. They're well into it. I expect some confirmation from them in the next few days. So what does that mean to us from the, uh, if they do endorse us? That means that the, they will do things like they will release a press release. They will mount a social media campaign. They will place media ads. They will use their email list for targeted emails to residents in Washtenaw County. So if we can get AARP's endorsement, I think we're in, it's, it's a much brighter future for us to have them on our side. One of the other large players in the game, uh, I've reached out to both. One is Trinity Health. Uh, the other campaigns uh, got an enormous amount of support and funding from hospitals. Uh, Trinity has already taken up the cause. It's in front of their advocacy group. I'm hoping that we'll get a positive response from Trinity, that they will also step into the campaign. Uh, we've also reached out to the U of M Health Department of Community Health Services. You know, they're the people that do uh, Meals on Wheels, uh, Housing Bureau for Seniors, uh, Lifelong Learning, 
um, Turner African American Services. We're hoping that they too will come to be an advocate for this program. They did, they did actually write a letter to the Board of Commissioners advocating for the establishment of a uh, aging for seniors office in the county. So they've already got their foot in the, in the game and we're hoping to, to get more from them. Uh, we continue to build a, a group of people who will be on this campaign committee from politicians to, you know, people who have previous campaign experience. Uh, I've reached out to Jim McGuire. Many of you may know Jim McGuire. He's a former CEO, policy advocacy director for AAA1B, one of the major architects for this. He's on board. He'll be joining in. <clears throat> so, so that's sort of to whom we've spoken and what we've done. I mean, I, I've spoken to the Dexter Senior Center. I've spoken to the Milan uh, Community Resource Center, Celine, uh, a lot, of, a lot of groups like that to gauge their interest and in where they are, where they are, and if they're willing to, you know, what what uh, resources they can provide. Uh, JFS, for example, is uh, they're sending out to uh, to their readership. They have a, a newsletter that goes out once a month to about three thousand households. That'll go out September first or October first with with something in there about the campaign and what we're up to and what we're doing. I've been working with um, Barbara Nies Mays and, and uh, her graphic artist from Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels to develop uh, flyers that we can hand out in information materials that are uh, easy to read, informative, that we can get in people's hands. We've had numerous people contact us on our website asking for further information. Uh, probably someplace between 50 to 100 people that have uh, signed up on the website for further information. Um, AAA or Ageways has uh, emailed back all of those people, plus they've emailed every uh, state and a, a federal official who is on the ballot in Washtenaw County, encouraging them to you know include us in their talking about things that their campaigns might support. Uh, we've established a... Um, a way to receive contributions. We have an email, we have a mailing address, we can take contributions. And um, I think in a nutshell, that's sort of, of where, what what we've done. Um, I'll, st I'll pause there for a moment and take a few questions. I have another thing I'd like to talk about, which is more about the the general tone of the campaign that we're trying to, to put forward. So any questions on what we've done to date or so far? Did you mention your Facebook page and all those ways to contact? I didn't. Well, Facebook page is, you know, it's in our, in, in all the flyers that goes out. Right. Well, I didn't mention yard signs. We've, I'll, I was going to get to that, but we've ordered 250 yard signs. They'll be here shortly. They'll be, you know, plastered all over wherever we can plaster them. So we have, that's already in here and they should be arriving hopefully sometime mid next week. Any questions okay. for Gary at this point? I'll press on. This may right. this may bring up some ideas. So, okay, so you know the word campaign is an interesting word. What the hell is a campaign? Well, it's a living, breathing kind of. It's it's a, actually a people focused moment. Uh, so here here are some of the things that uh, we've talked about uh, when we're we're trying to form our what does our campaign look like. So the general tone of the campaign. The general tone of the campaign is not about winning. It's not about twisting arms or asking people to vote yes. The focus of the campaign is the message that we're trying to carry forward because that really is what is important. Win, lose, or draw. The message needs to be what we get in front of people. So we are about educating and informing. And that opens lots of opportunities for us that you know we can, we can do lots of things with resources from nonprofits because nonprofits are allowed to educate and inform. They just can't ask for a particular outcome. Uh, so I talked a little bit about, that's the tone, but what does the campaign actually look like? Well, we wanna be, we wanna have a high impact. We don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars and I don't think we need hundreds of thousands of dollars because I believe that after talking with a number of people who have conducted campaigns and both political people and or ballot initiatives, we will be and have been besieged by a tsunami of political ads. My texts are 99% people asking me to contribute money and do things. What do I do with them? 
I delete them. Do I read them? Not at all. So our, the advice we've gotten is the most effective thing that we can do is word of mouth, word of mouth, presentations, uh, using earned media coverage. We all have relations with the media. We need to, we need to you know, uh, capitalize on those. We need to do things like radio interviews. We need to do letters to the editors. We, you know, we can use social media. Not, you know, I, I, everybody else is in that game. We can use yard signs. Um, I think we need to understand that really the agencies that have brought us thus, this far, thus far, everyone who's contributed, all the organizations like COA, we really need to lean into the people that we serve and have serviced. We, the organizations really need to be active in educating and informing the people that they're in contact with about the ballot. In 2022, 2022, 60% of the voters in 2022 were over the age of 60 years old. So we need, these are our people and we need to talk to those people. The other thing I wanna say is in the campaign, we really want to stress the concept of collaboration. That's what's gotten us here. We have, you know, county government, the COA, the Say Yes to Seniors, all of the service agencies and the aging network. It's important for people to, to know that this is something that comes from the grassroots. It's not a single point of origin, but it's a collaborative, widespread uh, effort by many to respond to the needs of seniors. Um, you know, we can't, we should never underestimate that, you know, the, all, the work that we do and have done so far, that we know about the challenges of older adults. And how do we know about that? We know about them firsthand because of the agencies and the aging network that are out there doing the service. I heard Allison speaking before the meeting about the things that she's trying to do with Meals on Wheels. We are informed because we have people who are in the field and who are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. We cannot underestimate the value of what collaboration means to our success. Okay, so that's my pitch, but here's the deal. Regardless of the tactics that we take, any communi whatever communication activities we might think are appropriate, the real key to unlock this is this face-to-face -face communication and it's the, the passion and the commitment of people that are gonna carry this forward. We all need to talk to people and they will feel from us how we care and are committed to this. It's, it's We are the champions of this. We need to be the champions of this. And that's what's critical to motivating the voters to vote in favor of what we're doing. That's about all I've got to say. I'll take any questions. Stunned silence, I can see it. <laughs> Annie. Yeah, hey Gary, thanks for all the work you're doing. Um, I just you're wanted welcome. to... Um, let everybody know that the Washtenaw County Democratic Party did endorse the millage. And so that will be included in the voter guide that goes out to um, a pretty big group of voters. Um, and so that's another avenue for folks who might already be affiliated with the county party. Um, if you're interested in in helping them get those um, voter guides out, um, you can you can find information on how to volunteer um, online. But I just we just did that at the county convention two weekends ago. And we had an overwhelming, we had overwhelming support. We had three, you know, a, a few people who were uh, in opposition, but the whole, basically the entire room um, voted yes. Annie, and that's it was really, a pretty that's, packed room. That's fabulous to hear that, Annie. That's really fabulous. One of the people that's joined our campaign is Pam Burns. And specifically Pam uh, and uh, my wife, Joanna, will be working to try to make contact with the uh, candidates that are on the ballot in November to, you know, reinforce or to help with any way we can to provide them with information or materials about how they may want to speak about the millage. So that's fantastic news, Annie. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely fantastic.
Anyone else? Comments, questions? I just, I know there's been a, a lot of talk about what you can and can't do. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I'm gonna to try to share my screen very quickly here. Uh, can you all see that document that I put up there? Yes. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff in here, but it's clear and I wanna make it perfectly clear. And I'm sure Maria's made this clear. The COA cannot in any way, shape or form in, endorse the millage. You can't ask for a yes or no vote on the millage. Nonprofits are in a little bit different situation because I think nonprofits get a little confused about a political candidate versus a political question, a question mm -hmm. on the ballot. Nonprofits can actually take a position on a ballot question. They cannot take a position on, uh, uh, on a political candidate. However, I will say that that is tempered by the fact that as a matter of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, as a matter of good policy, the decision to endorse or oppose a ballot measure should be made by the organization's board of directors. So that's it. But here's the thing. There are no limitations to what nonprofit staff can do uh, regarding ballot uh, initiatives. Uh, so you as an individual, not on behalf of, can do um, anything that you'd like, but uh, in, in, in the context of your organization or in the COA, there are restrictions that do apply. Bruce, I see your oh. hand. Um, Gary, um, thanks again for the presentation and all the wonderful work you and so many are doing. Um, the two questions I have are more about getting back to the um, the kind of nonprofit structure you're kind of allude you kind yeah. of alluded to is. Yeah. Uh, say yes is a 501c3 correct no no say yes has no 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 standing of any any sort at all so there's no 501c3 or 501c4 that no. we can affiliate with okay no um, is that been discussed at all or um... uh well no not really not seriously and it's far far too late because it takes years to make that happen well years i know it's too late for the for the for november but having, you know, assuming and hoping that it'll be a positive outcome in November. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about an office of aging um, and we haven't, that's part of our ongoing discussions about what that mm -hmm. would look like and what mm -hmm. auspices that would have. But right. um, the fact that you were just sharing this information about what nonprofits can and can't do, right. um, it seems like it would be worth um, consideration for what kinds of support systems we need to put in place other than the kind of networks that we have in place already in um in Washington which are really basically you know a function of coalitions and a function of um specific uh projects or research or funding um what would be a more lasting kind of structure and voice that would allow us to do the kind of grassroots leadership and connect that to other um, countywide leadership. Bruce, that's a great point. I'm going to put that, I got my pen in my hand. I'm going to write that down and look into that. I'm going to ask other others, like I've consulted with other groups, what they've done post-election in terms of this very concept and see if we can get some answer about that. Uh, you know, I'm not going to take much more of your time. I just want to say there are some thorny issues around the millage that we have run up against, and I just want to quickly enumerate them. People always want to know where's the money going to go who's gonna decide how the money gets spent. And the other one that I hear a lot is the people in rural Western Washtenaw County don't want to be left behind. So we are working to put together talking points about those kinds of things. Uh, but those are, those are ones that have come up already and need to be addressed. It's only fair that to be addressed, they need to be addressed honestly, forthrightly, um, but those are the three that we've seen so far. Gary, I would add a fourth question that may be worth yeah. um, anticipating is, I think there's often a misconception as to the kind of wealth and health and standing of um, seniors. And uh -huh. there, really, there really is multiple 
um, levels of security, economic yep. security, health security, whatsoever. Yeah. Whatever. Yes. Um, and I think it would be helpful to talk about that kind of inequality and the divide between older people who really can afford certain things and a larger majority who cannot, certainly at the moment and probably cannot go forward having the necessary resources. Do you see this document on your screen? This is a document authored by COA. It's an author, a document that you guys put together. It speaks yeah. terrifically to demographics and what the demographics look like and about social or uh, justice, aging justice in this document. It's it's a it's a very good representation, I think, of exactly what you're talking about. Is so, that Sarah's? Is that from Sarah's report? No, this is from put together by COA and it's from, drawn on materials from uh, a, the Healthy Aging Collaborative from the Arab Ann Arbor Mary Community Foundation, their strategic, their uh, grassroots uh, root cause study that they did. So it's in this document, right, but right, it, right. It, it's a good source for that very information. Great. I would just say that as an anticipatory question, that would be a yep. good one. Yep. Thank you. Is that on our website, Marie? Yes, it is. Yes, it yes, is. It is. Um, yep. Great, great document. Thank you. I worked hard on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I have it in my, obviously in my stack of, you know, it's in my quiver of arrows that I pull out when I need to have some statistic or information about what's going on, particularly finan the financial uh, talk about the status of seniors and their income and where their income goes is frightening. I mean, it's yeah. frightening. Yeah, that's so, from uh, AAA1B or now Ageways. Yeah, yeah, yeah they did yeah. those yeah. those questions. Oh, right. Margie? Yeah, Gary, can you send us that document you had uh, put on the screen about what nonprofit? Yes, I okay. certainly can. Yeah, I'll send that it to Marie, and she can. I'll send yeah. it to Marie, and she can uh, pump it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. We probably yeah that that was a result of uh, that was a result of one of the I think from uh, that came from Kalamazoo County. Kalamazoo County actually hired a full time consultant to do their entire campaign. Their, their citizens group was more like, you know, a sort of say yes to the to the person. Uh, and but that was one of the outcomes of theirs is that he provided them with this documentation. So I will certainly pass that along. OK, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, I don't know how many days it is until November 5th, but it's, it's counting down. I'm moderately mildly optimistic about this but uh that doesn't mean that we can sit in the back seat we need to stay with our foot on the pedal and we will do that and as things come and happen when i find out what aarp is going to do when when i find out what trinity health and u of m medical services are going to do uh you will be on my list to know right away um Gary, did you say there was, you have a committee that's sort of um, the mastermind of how you're uh, moving this forward? Yeah, I wouldn't call it, yeah, mastermind. It's interesting. It, 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 yeah, we have a committee. It's still in, in its formative moments. We, we it's, um, I got to tell you that I've made entrees to many people that I would like to do it. Uh, some are a little skittish about committing to resources and time to doing it. Uh, but we've had some others that are really great. I'm waiting for, I'm trying to uh, wade into the Eastern part of the County. I've been talking to some people who are currently members of the Ypsilanti uh, city uh, council that have expressed interest in our potential candidates. So I'm trying to broaden it. I'm trying to look geographically uh, about it. I'm trying to look topically about membership, um, but yeah, it's a, a work in progress. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Gary, one other quick question. Um, you mentioned the, the fact that the 60% of the, the voters are 60 and mm -hmm. older, which obviously suggests a lot, you know, a pretty um strong potential for voter yeah. turnout in that area. Given the importance of this national election on November 5th, right. um, and referencing something that Jasmine had mentioned in, in our subcommittee meeting, are there any particular strategies to reach out to other likely voter populations, including younger people, that might hear this message in a way that would allow them to, to weigh in yeah. positive? 
there definitely are uh, talking about uh, uh, different uh, things. There's one group we feel of unique voters that cuts across all age groups and all kinds of economics, and that's caregivers. Caregivers is, is an enormously large group across the country. It's billions of hours of caregiving every week. Family, it's family, families, and family. family mm -hmm. uh, it's family oriented. It covers all age groups. It's something that we're specifically all wrestling with how to deal with. But when we talk about ways to capture voters from various, you know, uh, age groups and income groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, you know, be, let them know, the caregivers know that we're trying to do something. I think that's one of our, that's one of our big focus groups is caregivers. But there aren't, not that there aren't others. Um, have you um, focused on um, some of the long-term care facilities? Uh, maybe the voter uh, guide is good for that. Yeah. Yeah, the answer, direct answer, Margie, is have I focused on long? No, I have not focused on that. Um, uh, one of the things that we're focused, well, yeah, there's lots of things to focus on. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. One of the things we're focusing on really is, and this this is where your group could really help. And Annie, thank you for your telling us about the Democratic Party, is we need to have people who will give us testimonials. We need people who are willing to add their name to a list of group of people that support this. So, you know, we will put the Democratic Party, we will put AARP, we'll put Trinity Health, but we need, we need, if you have contacts with individuals yourself and or others who would like to, you know, add their names to a list like that, that's one thing we're really trying to work very diligently on collecting. We're just starting that wheels in motion. So you'll hear more about that. But testimonials is something we're really interested in, in, in getting to. Yeah. Stories. Stories. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I abbreviated my talk a little bit, but I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. I, I mean, my thing is, you know, we need to, that's exactly down here, is uh, we need to, you know, the stress, the... Um, the the stories of the people that we're serving and we have some documents about that that we had a we had a messaging committee and they put together a, a document that's very enlightening about some of the around all of the issues that we've talked about but specific comments from seniors older older adults about their struggles in these various areas which are extraordinarily powerful and we'd like to use those yeah i, I also think the um just one last quick thought on this but kind of alongside of the caregiving message that kind of intergenerational that this is an investment for the next generations as yeah. well That's because right. it's, it's not long before yeah younger caregivers are being cared for that's right that's right that's right absolutely correct well i thank you for your time and i also you know um we we would have never gotten here without the, all of the work that the Commission on Aging is done. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for all the things that you will do. Because back to Bruce's point about having organizations that see into the future and that this is not a one and done and the military passes. And then, you know, we all sort of retreat into the woodwork. Uh, this is something that we need to champion from now forward. We're, we're just getting started. We're just getting started now. We're, you know, we're, we're out of the gate and we're, we're moving. We have momentum and uh, now is the time to, to push that forward into the future. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Gary. You're entirely Thank welcome. Y'all have a great day now and go blue, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. Bye. All right, so um, that kind of segues us into our subcommittee updates. Knowing that the Say Yes to Senior group was going to be coming today, I asked the Looking Forward um, subcommittee to put together some thoughts and potential action steps uh, for what, what could be happening next. Um, Taylor shared a first draft of that with you all. Um, 
I had provided the subcommittee some updates. Taylor wasn't CC'd on that, so she didn't know. <laughs> um, but I have that here and I'm happy to, to share um, the screen. But before I do that, I'll turn it over to the looking forward, moving forward subcommittee. Um, you can share your thoughts and let me know when you want me to, to share the screen for the document that you put together. Your subcommittee want to share anything? Anybody want to go? Um, Allison or Phyllis? They're strategically staying muted, Bruce. Might be you. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just say that we we were trying to take literally the um, the idea of both looking forward and moving forward, and hopefully looking beyond a successful um, result in November. And um, if that had, if that is the case, it, you know, there were certain things, and, and Gary sort of already touched on things that we could do between now and November fifth, um, and he kind of highlighted the important ones. We wanted to also then touch on two kind of periods that would follow, uh, hopefully, this positive result. One would be that period immediately after the November fifth until such time that the monies were actually able to be distributed, most likely sometime in 2026. So there's a, anywhere from a year and a half to two year period where a lot of things could take place and probably and need to take place. And then that kind of longer term, um, if I, am, am I correct, Marie, in, in understanding that the millage is like an eight year commitment? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, and is that from the time it's passed or is that from the time the money starts to flow, do you know? Um, I think it's sort of in between. So there's like when it passes, when it's technically enacted and then money is collected after it's enacted. Um, okay, I don't so, have the exact date for you, but it is eight years. So roughly sometime around 2032, 33, there's a six to eight year time frame. Um, beyond that little interim period where things are being pulled together. And what, as we started to look ahead, obviously that's a longer look ahead, but we started to think about things that we could begin to talk about. This is really meant, the document was really meant as much of, as much for a discussion piece as it was for any kind of immediate action. And so we were presenting that with the idea that it would trigger some thoughts, some additions, some questions and um and most importantly i think it it kind of forces us to in a good way to think about our role and what are those kind of limits that we have but where are there areas that we really can step out and um begin to do some additional work uh as a body um and and in collaboration with others to the degree that we're able to do that so that was sort of the context for sending that out um, and I don't know if people have had much chance to look at it, but as um, as Marie mentioned, it's it's a first draft. Um, it's really meant to sort of get us going. And uh, I'll stop there and see if either Allison or Phyllis wants to unmute themselves. Marky, I see you have a question. Yeah. Um, well. I think this is really just a great piece of work here, and um, it causes us to really bring to the fore the things we need to think about. And um, the the one question I what I didn't understand was the very last uh, page. It says notes from call with uh, COA. Oh. <laughs> I that. That didn't make much sense to me. That wasn't supposed to be included. I was taking oh. notes from our subcommittee meeting, and those were some ideas that were that came up. And so you can kind of ignore that. I mean, although some of them are may find them, for example, added outreach. I think people had um, Allison and Phyllis had some very good points about reaching out to the. This is be, things to do between now and November, for example, how we could reach out to the chamber, how we could reach out to. Um, uh, to the higher ed, how we could reach out to other places. So those those notes meant weren't meant to be included. Yeah, well, I think reaching out to the chamber is is a great thing to do. 
Yeah, so that was that was just some of our brainstorming as we met as a subcommittee. Yeah. Um, so I had I had comments for them too. Um, one aspect of my comments were wanting to make sure we didn't come across in in a public document as um, working on the campaign because, like I said before, we're not allowed to do that. So I removed some of those languages, and then there were a few other things that I liked, but I didn't. Um, know how we as a as a commission on aging could do something like what was recommended and and some of those things so i offered my feedback to the group already and i included some of those changes on the screen here that i'm sharing with you all um and i think you know based on what gary was sharing um it would be good for us to spend a couple of minutes looking at this um pre-election period um, seeing what, what we could do. We, we have said that as a commission on aging, we recommend a senior millage and there's some other things along those lines that we can do to continue to show our support for a senior millage. Um, is this large enough for everyone to see? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So some things that, um, I, added to what the group started were to update the Commission on Aging webpage to include educational information on the senior millage. Um, and I've been watching what this AS to senior group is doing to see if there, what educational pieces they put out um, that we could put on our website. Um, and Ashley agreed to, to help with that, which is super great because I don't have access to the website itself. Um, we could look at distributing a press release on the information sessions and board of commissioner discussions that will be held. Um, I got a talk with someone in administration last week and they're talking about um, internally at this point, what are some ways that um, the millage could be distributed, um, office on aging set up, and some of those discussions are happening in the background. Um, this staffer was saying that probably at the end of September or beginning of October, those those discussions will be moved to the Board of Commissioners um, for public discussion and dis some early decisions to, to be made and, and shared. So um, we want to make sure that the public is staying aware of those discussions on if the millage passes, this is how it could be handled. Um, hosting presentations and discussions on how the millage will benefit older adults. That's something that we've kind of been doing anyways. We have all these presenters come, they share with us the great work that they're doing and the need that's still there. And I think that highlights, you know, the importance of having something sustainable, a funding mechanism that's sustainable um, for the work that's happening and that will continue to grow as the aging population grows. And then review board of commissioner identified priorities and possible budgets when it's released. Um, we, as a advisory body, we, we can give some recommendations along those lines. And so we just need to stay aware of when those discussions are happening, what those are, um, so we can give our input. Is there any I, um, amendments you'd all like to make to that? Any additional ideas you'd like to throw in that we as a commission on aging could do? in the near future? No, the subcommittee and uh, it's just perfect. They did a great job. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Then, uh, oh, go how, ahead. How do, how do we distribute a press release? Um, we use Ashley. Um, the county staffer that mm. usually comes to our meeting. She wasn't able to be here today, but um, we would draft something and she could um, share it. If we're going to do a, a press release on information sessions and board discussions to be held, um, it wouldn't have to be like super long fancy. It's probably just going to be an introduction, bullet points on dates and you know locations and then um, wrapping up, but that, that would be my vision. 
Mm-hmm. I have one question. One of the things with the election coming up, I know um, I've been seeing it on social media, but is I don't know if it's something that we can recommend, but the there's the, a great flyer that I've seen um, that shows people like where you're pulling place, who's eligible to apply mm. for absentee ballot, just resources for our seniors so that they don't get bullied or feel like their vote doesn't count and I mean, we're starting to hear about some of those things that's happening in the South that people told like that yeah. they no longer are a voter and not that I think any of that's going to happen in Michigan, but is that, could that be something as well that we should have a presentation on or something that we can recommend that that information be able to get out uh, to seniors in the community? Yep. Well, State. Oh, go ahead. Well, you, you mean like um, information about um, where to vote, um, absentee ballots, that sort of thing? Yeah, just all in one place, just so folks. So I know like I myself went online the first day you could and asked for, you know, an absentee ballot and you could fill it all out online and you were done. Whereas mm-hmm. in Ohio, you can start the process online, but you have to print it out and you still have to mail it in. You can't do the whole process electronically. So there are little differences and you wanna make sure someone's not hearing mixed information on how that can be done. Well, you know, League of Women Women Voters always refers people to four, I think it's 411. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great resource. Um, yeah, I just I was just thinking just to make sure because we are starting to hear about that. I don't know if you've nationally some things are going on in certain states, not in ours, but um, we are a battleground state, so you never know if um, yeah. anything can right. happen. Well, maybe we should put that information on our website. Yeah, uh, how to get to four one one, and um. Uh, help distribute the voter guide as well. Um, Mm -hmm. So maybe we should have a little spot on the website about voting. Agreed, yeah. Well, Annie, you had said about getting the voter guides out. So you need people to go like door to door to get those out, is that? No, I read something. um, um, There's an organization called um, PEG um protecting equality in government i think it's called and they had a a thing the other day that said they need people to deliver the voter guides and they would be i've done it before it's in a pack um you go pick it up and you're told where to deliver it like various nursing homes uh libraries whatever so they, they do need people to do that so I think that we're sharing that on behalf of the Washtenaw County Democratic Party. Um, and so my recommendation is that ever, you just go to the WCDP website. I don't want to talk too much more about it on here just because it's political. Do you say DWDP? Sorry, WCDP. That's the local Democratic Club's website. And that's where you can find the volunteer info. Okay. Or you could stop by the downtown Ipsy office if you're in the area. Great. Bruce? Um, State leadership, the Secretary of State and Attorney General and and the Governor and others are very concerned about Michigan and disinformation. It's it's been, you know, because we're, especially because we are a um, swing state. um, So that has been already a voice quite actively and I think we, we don't want to get complacent even in a um, because I think that there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening over the next two months. As the closer we get to the election date, the more potential for intimidation, confusion, misinformation, um, telling people absolutely wrong things about, you know, absentee, all, all aspects of voting. There's just an army of things potentially geared up and the Democratic Party is trying to offset that and they have a lot of um, a lot of resources in the state. But one thing that I think we could do is, um, I, I don't know the structure in, in the county well enough, but 
Is there a registrar for each voting district or voting community in Washtenaw County? Is it worth just, you know, reaching out as a, a con concern, going back to the point people made earlier, the concern for um, uh, older people getting wrong information or, or, or being intimidated in, in some way. Um, so maybe just to, if there's one for each community or one for each ward, or I don't know that structure, maybe Annie or somebody does. Annie? Um, yeah, well, two things. I can get information out to everybody on how to report um, situations where there's like clear attempts to um, commit fraud and, and give people that information. Um, there's, there's a way to report that to, um, I think both the Secretary of State and the Attorney General. Um, we have the, both parties have precinct delegates. And so the Democratic Party, we have precinct delegates in every community, and that's broken down by voting precincts. Um, and so my recommendation is that somebody, you know, outside of this, you know, meeting, you can reach out to the volunteer coordinator at the WCDP and they can help. And this is honestly probably something that Gary should do. Um, I don't know if he's still on here. Um, they can connect you with all the precinct delegates and those folks can help um, get both information out about um, like factual voter information. And if we find out that there are acts of like fraud being committed that we know about, um, warning people of those tactics and then also um, just getting information out. Great. Other ideas? Great, we can um, continue to look at this and discuss the next items like as we continue um, having meetings for the sake of time. I'll stop sharing my screen pull my agenda back up. Um, there were, where'd it go? Um, so, so next up is the report from the Board of Commissioners. Annie, do you have anything that you'd like to share from the board? Um, I'm reluctant to share this because I don't actually have any information. And so please, uh, I guess I'm just gonna preface this with, I don't have any answers to questions that you might ask about this. Um, we are gonna be getting a presentation from the Deputy County Administrator at our next working session meeting um, about the structure of the Office on Aging. I don't know anything else besides that. I know that there's a presentation that will be given to the board and that's all, all the information I have. And so I would recommend either tuning in to that meeting that night or watching it later um, on the recording. Um, and that's all I have right now. The date again? Oh, I'm sorry, the 17th, or sorry, 18th of September. 18th. 5 p.m., 5.30, sorry. The 5.30 working session. Yeah. And if anything changes, I'll let you know, but I just found that information out yesterday, so. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Um, next is report from me, your chair. Um, I don't have much to report. Um, I had talked to a county staffer last week that said that th these conversations might be happening at the board commissioner level soon. So I'm glad that Annie has a date for us. Um, and I've actually been getting a lot of requests via our um, contact form on our website for services. Um, there's been probably five or six in this last month um, when it's been crickets most of the year. So that's I'm I'm glad that people are finding that and they're they're submitting requests and I'm able to connect them with the agencies and help that they're looking for. Um, so that's that. Um, the a couple of questions that I've gotten from a few members and this kind of moves us into new business. Um, is around commissioner, our commission's terms and renewals. So our terms are for two years. Um, there are some of us who will 
be expiring this December and another chunk of us who will expire the next December. Um, for renewals, you do have to reapply every time that um, renewals come up. You, you do expire and you have to reapply. If you know that you are not going to reapply, I would highly recommend that you reach out to your network, your neighbors to see if there's somebody who um, would be willing to apply and take your place. You can't guarantee that because obviously your um, commissioner gets to look at the resumes and applications and they get to, to make that final pick, but it certainly helps to um, start pointing people in that direction to replace you. Yeah, Marta. I think it would be great if you sent out a list of whose terms are expiring this year for those of us who can't remember. Sure. Um, I will also get from Ashley the web page that you go to to reapply. Um, I don't know when that comes live. I think last time that I had to reapply, I feel like it was November and December, perhaps, but mm -hmm. I don't know that for sure. I'll get that information from Ashley. Margie? Yeah, um, do we have an update on the vandalism that occurred at the Ipsy Meals on Wheels? I do not have an update, but I will connect with Barbara and see what I can find out for you. Um, okay. Anything specific that you're looking for? No, just just that they're um, they're doing okay. They did get some support, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just kind of like to know that they're doing okay. Great. Um. Anyone else have questions, items of new business that you want to discuss? in our last few minutes together. Great, so our next meeting will be October 4th. Um, we'll have Justine and Patricia come back so we can um, finish talking about support and what a motion would look like around Teresa's law. Um, we will have the emergency management, someone from emergency, um, planning at Washtenaw County come and present to us. We're trying to find the uh, weatherization um, program rep two to come talk at next meeting. So that will be a nice full meeting for all of us. <laughs> um, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out. I'll have Taylor follow up um, hopefully next week with um, some of the materials that we talked about today. Thank you, everyone. Um, motion to, we don't need a motion to adjourn, but if we need thumbs up or head nods, yes, great, adjourning, wonderful. All right, we'll see you all next month. Okay, thanks.